Uh, my name is Simon Stewart. I work at a company called Envision IT. Uh, we do some stuff. Um, and I'm going to talk about how pet projects can make you happy and allow you to do some cool stuff. So I think a lot of you might be doing something like this already. But I'm hoping that this is going to give you a little bit more information around the benefits of it and maybe give you a little bit of a framework around how to actually implement it. It is pretty um, kind of low-key, so it's not intended to be like a, like a business talk. I'm sure you're going to get enough of those later on the next two days, uh, but I'll skip those ones as well. So just to kind of start things off, I, I see there being three kinds of people. I see there being people that create stuff, I see there being people that destroy stuff, and I see people that just observe and kind of write stuff in their, in their Moleskine and notebooks the whole time. So who's a, who's a creator? Who's a creator? Was that? I write it down. Okay, so I'm thinking like most of us are, are people that create stuff, which is cool. Uh, I'm a developer, so I get to kind of use my skills to create kind of abstract stuff as opposed to some physical you can kind of point to. But it doesn't really matter. We kind of get, get to create stuff, which is a really cool thing. Right, so the, the human memory is a really weird thing for me because they talk about what makes something memorable is something that has high emotion or has, has repetition. So something that happens the whole time or something that has some, some peak of emotion and that governs whether or not we memorize or remember something. But then there's this other force that they, that they don't really speak about, which I don't think is something that they're ever really going to work out. And that is this random screenshot that your brain does, where for reasons completely beyond anyone's understanding, there's certain fragments of, of your life leading up until now that you, you remember. And some of them are good things and some of them aren't, aren't good things. And it's a really weird situation because you're not really in control of that. And if you think back, and I think back of some of them the companies I've worked for and how bad some of them were and unfortunately you kind of remember that and I kind of wish A, I didn't remember it, which would be, even, which would be ideal, um, so maybe I'm a strength ball like some of the people sitting in the front, um, or you've got to be in a bit more control about, about the environments that you're in, which is kind of what this is all about. It's about trying to be in an environment doing something cool, so if that, if that screenshot happens in your mind, you're going, to, you're going to capture this really cool fragment of what you were busy doing, as opposed to laboring away on something that you don't really care about. So that's kind of what, what I want to do. Spend as much time as I can doing something cool on the off chance that I'm going to remember it, and it's going to you know, keep, me, keep me happy when I'm old, and playing bingo, and watching Matlock reruns, and things like that. So in terms of the definition of a, of a pet project, and this, kind of, this doesn't really matter about where you work. If you're working in a startup, your pet project is your project, so it's kind of different. Uh, and this could, this could rather even be a, an R&D project if you're working for a corporate, uh, or something in between. So a pet project for me is something that uh, is a small unit of work, so we're not talking about a long running thing, and it's something that you're gonna do, so it's an individual thing, and it's something that you're gonna do because you want to, as opposed to something that you have to do because you're getting paid to do it, or you have to do it because you've been told to do it and you don't really want to do it. So it's something that you, you do because you actually want to do it. Um, so pictures of rainbows and unicorns and things like that. So. so it's about trying to get this intersection of, of the things that you love to do, uh, the things that you're good at doing, and hopefully something that someone's going to pay you to do. Uh, and I think a lot of the, the startups that I've worked with can kind of tick one of those boxes, maybe, maybe two of them, but to try and get that intersection is very difficult. And my, the, the thing that I strive to do, and I strive to do with my team as well, which is not an easy thing to do, is to try and get that intersection. So you can't get it, you know, for, for a 40-hour for week, I was going to say 80-hour week, but actually I'm hoping to recruit some people, so stick to 40. Um, <laughs> but it's to try and get that intersection. If money was the only uh, the only driving force, and if there's only driving force to me, I wouldn't be here at the moment. I'd either be robbing a bank, or I'd be working in government. So one of the two, if money is the only, only objective. But for me, it's, it's not that easy, because I, I don't want to work in government, and the other option also isn't really that appealing. Um, but again, it's not, it's not just about money, it's about having fun, and about working with good people, and about learning stuff, and, and kind of moving forward in your, in your skill set. Uh, so again, that's kind of what, what I want to do. 
So I asked, I asked earlier on if um, you, know, you, you laugh. I, I actually had this picture already. It wasn't like I actually looked for it. It's the, the things you find when you have safe search off. Uh, you put safe search on. Yes. Ah, exactly. No one does. It's not cool. Um, someone say, what is what is safe search on? What is that? So I asked in the beginning about whether people see themselves as curators. And, and I see myself as a curator because you try and create stuff. Sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. Uh, these people are not. So I'm, I'm hoping that the people that I'm going to meet are, are of the same mindset, where we strive to actually create something and, and have a fun time. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of what I want to do. And we're actually really lucky. Um, who's, a, who's a developer? Hence the, hence the tech part of the, the conference now. Um, so we, we're actually really lucky because we can sit down and we can open up our, our I was going to say MacBook, but I don't have a MacBook. Um, and we can actually write some code and we can create something. It's, it's, the best, it's the best job in the world in, in a lot of respects. It really is. Because we can just sit down and just get it done. We don't have to really plow through a lot of management deadwood to get things done, which is cool. Um, so there, there is a problem. Um, it's got a slightly more kind of dev angle to it, which is cool because it seems most of the people are <coughs> developers. I've done a lot of lot of interviewing over the last several years, from the last sort of ten years. I've interviewed a lot um, to interview people who can work at companies or for companies to interview people that are going to work at their, their companies. And the issue that I found is the general skill level is actually very very low, which is concerning. It really is. Given the amount of content that's out there, uh, particularly now with these, these online universities, the, the ease of use of actually finding the information, and the fact that a lot of people, um, I'm not going to say the 99%, but it's certainly the vast majority, don't actually care enough to actually learn and improve themselves, which, is, which always kind of confuses me. Uh, I like a problem that makes sense, and then I can kind of work it out, but then problems like that come up, and that just, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, Scott Hanselman refers to this, this bulk of people as the unmotivated masses. Uh, the percentage varies, obviously, in industry and, and countries and that kind of thing. I'm looking at it as being probably 80%. Um, I don't know if that's really elitist, but I think it's more or less around that sort of, that sort of amount. And my feeling, honestly, is, is companies that matter have developers that care. So if you're working with developers that don't care, that's a major warning sign for yourself in that team, as well as the company in general. We're not, we're not working at huge corporates where we can hide. We've actually got to stand up and actually get stuff done, um, which is cool. You know, it's kind of what, what we're there for. We're actually there to kind of type away and, and use lots of curly braces and things like that. So one of the, the things that comes up from a lot of people about why they don't do things or why they don't learn or why they don't have pet projects is, is time. It's the, it's the easiest answer to any, to any problem. Um, so who watches MasterChef or Breaking Bad? Okay. So, so there's lots of time to be had. Um, I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't, don't watch any TV. I'm not saying don't watch any TV. Uh, I'm just saying, just kind of bear in mind, you're kind of giving one up for the other. Um, if you're going to watch something, watch like Walking Dead. Which is nice. <laughs> um, Obviously, you've got to wait for it to come out officially. There's no other way of actually getting it. it? <laughs> so the, the other thing that, that people don't say, but, but happens to be the truth, in my opinion, is, is around motivation. Is around, are they motivated to actually move themselves forward and move their companies forward? It's one thing to not move yourself forward, but if the knock-on effect is you don't move your company or your team or your product forward, that's got a whole different spin to it. There's a whole bunch of other reasons. I'm not going to, this is the kind of last slide about, about the kind of negative angle. Um, but you know what? I'm all about quality of life. I'm not saying you must, you must be a, an open source dev and kind of only do that and do that like 24 hours a day and never actually enjoy any of the other aspects of life. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying you can, you can get some kind, of, some kind of balance. And the idea that saying, oh, but I work full time, you know, I can't do anything else, I can't have any pet projects. If you work full time, you've got a venture capitalist like paying you money every month, which is awesome. 
you don't have to pitch for it, you just have to kind of pitch up for work and you get your, your VC money. So that's kind of one angle. So why do it? It's all about a demonstration of passion. That's really as, as simple as it gets for me. It's around being able to demonstrate what you're passionate about and about getting, getting stuff done in that, in that area, in that project. So it's ideal that we can demonstrate passion in everything that we do, but some of the projects that one has to work on or some of the teams and some of the, the structures you've got to contend with don't always lend themselves to being, to being passionate about what you do. It is ideal, but it's not always going to be the case. So that's where these, these idea of pet projects come in. And you really you can't expect a, a corporate to necessarily have your career ambitions in mind when they hand out project assignments. Uh, you know, it doesn't really make sense. As, as ideal as it is, and again with those unicorns in the background. And it's about trying to have more, more tools in the toolbox. So if you only have one, one tool, which is going to be that, that proverbial hammer, everything's going to look like a nail. But if you can spend time actually kind of fleshing out your, your set of skills, it just opens things up and it allows you to have a much better understanding about the solutions that customers want and about how they actually go about doing things. So there are a couple of ways of marketing a pet project. Um, some of them are very <laughs> obvious. Uh, the one thing which I'm sure you're going to see over the next two days is people having their, no their notebooks open during talks and, and at the breaks and having something cool on screen just to kind of get people's interest. Um, so it's that, that kind of screen hack during a conference. It does work pretty well. So for those who've got really interesting projects or really interesting bits of code, just kind of like randomly keep it open and then someone will look at it and then they'll ask questions and then kind of the whole thing kind of rolls on from there. It's quite a cool technique. So I've been a, I've been a fan of, of something called Hamster Projects for a couple of years, um, for about 10 years, which is a bit concerning. Um, and my feeling, and you can apply this to a lot of different things, but when you start a project, whether it's an actual project in a corporate or it's a pet project, along with starting the project, you buy a hamster. And when the hamster dies, you move on to another project. It's like a, a natural way of kind of just getting you to, to cycle two projects and move on. So you must, you must, try, it in, you must try it in a corporate. It, it works, it's interesting results. So how to make it work in a corporate. So there are a couple of different things. I'm going to go through a couple of, couple of ideas. Um, obviously, all the slides are, are available. But something really interesting came out of, out of 3M in the 40s, which is you know, kind of a bit weird. We've got to wait sort of 70 years to kind of learn from them. But there were two different things. The one is this idea of experimentation begets innovation. So if you're not experimenting via pet projects or some kind of R&D system in, in your company, the chance of you coming across innovation is going to be pretty small. So experimentation begets innovation. And the next, which I think is a, a fantastic mindset to have in a company, is it's okay to daydream. That's not to say you can only daydream, but it's saying it's, it's okay to do that. It's okay to let your mind wander and to experiment with things, provided of course the basic kind of premise of employment is being satisfied as well. Um, so, so try and get that, um, that common ground. And the worst case scenario is something that you need to play out in your mind. If the worst case scenario is we lose a little bit of time, is that really going to be a bad thing? Is that really going to be a, um, something that's going to kill a company? It's, it's not going to be. If you're trying to experiment with things on a project for big customers, that's a big warning. But if you can put these things in little kind of quarantine blocks and <coughs> give them a bit of time and maybe a bit of money, then the worst case scenario is you just lose that little bit of time, but you've, you've gained a bit of knowledge. So don't do these kind of things on projects. <coughs> uh, a couple of the criteria. So again, this very much depends on whether it's a big company or a small company and what kind of technology you guys are using. Uh, but just to give you a, a couple of points that are work for us. So <coughs> management buy-in is obviously a must. You must make sure that, that the management types actually understand, full stop, uh, and also understand what it is that you're actually trying to do. It needs to have some kind of applicability to the business or the upcoming projects as well. So to, to use technologies that have no bearing on your business at all is going to be pretty difficult to, to substantiate come kind of board meeting time. So you need to find that, that business angle that's going to help you going forward. Um, and the other thing which I'm a big fan of is keeping these things pretty short uh, and also trying to keep them as a single developer or a single person team. 
And the reason you do that, in my opinion, is that it keeps, or it allows that person to actually take full credit, as opposed to being part of a big team where maybe the people that are not the loudest are not going to come through as being the stars. By assigning something to one person, you allow them to actually uh, kind of show you exactly what they can do. So just, a, just an example of a sample project. Uh, obviously, you guys can kind of take a look at that and see. There's got to be some reward at the end of the day. So yes, knowledge is going to be cool, uh, but often within a company, you need to have a slightly different angle as well. <coughs> you guys can take a look at that slide um, at the end. In terms of assignment, the way you'd actually hand out these projects, it's, it comes down to, to this idea of the cathedral and the bazaar. You guys have read cathedral and the bazaar? So it's the, the kind of two different ways of running, running project teams. The cathedrals are very much the, the top-down, kind of the parochial way of doing things. And the bazaar is more like the open source, so the bazaar like market, as opposed to like a bazaar. Um, so it comes down to those two different ways of doing things. And it, it also determines how you're going to run things within your company. So if you're going to do it from the company's perspective, you can always say, here's a, a list of projects that have, been, that have been approved or that make sense from the business point of view and allow developers to pick from that list. You can do it via some kind of rotation policy and say, you know what, learning about X now makes sense to us. So uh, it's then available for someone to pick and say, yes, I'll do that. So I'll run with that. It is going to be important if you're part of a, a bigger organization to make sure that there's some way of vetting what people choose. So either you have a, a list of pre-approved projects, which does work, or you can just allow people to say, what about doing X, Y, and Z? But there needs to be some way of saying, yes, that actually makes sense. Uh, allowing someone to experiment with some component that somebody's already done just seems like a complete waste of time. So staff rewards is very important. You need to make sure that the staff can benefit from what they're doing. And like I said, saying you know, it's the gift of knowledge um, doesn't really work all that well. Uh, for a lot of people, so there needs to be some additional way of actually getting through to people about the benefit for them. And one of the big things for me is about having extra stuff to put on your CV. And it's something that I tell my team, that if we can do this, and if we can learn this, and if we can go on this sort of training, it gives them extra stuff to put on their CV, which for a lot of people is kind of a weird thing to say. It kind of say, says that you're kind of implying they're going to they're leave, which is not the case. But it, the, the reason I say it is to try and let them know that actually care about their futures and their and their uh, careers so you need to make sure that they've got something to actually add so company rewards again the company's got a benefit from a technology or a um, uh, sure, technology standpoint the more stuff you know the better you can actually offer your customers and it also allows you to get rid of these things uh, these technical spikes so these small technical risks you can actually get rid of so a couple of cautions uh, I'm just going to go through that point, you guys can kind of go through that on your own. Uh, the one point just to take away is about don't force it. So there are some people in teams that you cannot get to be enthusiastic about ideas, which is fine. You've just got to leave it and maybe come back to it at a later point. And there are also some companies where it's not going to work as well. So a couple of lessons of things that I've done. So this was a startup I had a couple of years ago. And the biggest takeaway for me is don't have a cool idea and do it or don't do it and then you leave it for a couple of years and then find someone that ran with it and actually made it into something successful and you see the headline on Hacker News. That's, that's soul destroying. So, so just kind of be wary of doing that kind of thing. Uh, the next one is a, a site that I run which lists a whole bunch of free Wi-Fi spots. So I open up the torrent. Um, and the big thing is to make sure that these things are easy for other people to contribute. Uh, you'll find it really, really surprising, like I did, that people want to contribute. The next one is uh, the JavaScript conference that I run. Um, I always read in management books about pivoting is hard, which I guess it is. But I think what's even harder is, is iterating and making things incrementally better year on year or release on release. That to me is a lot more difficult than just pivoting and, and changing what you're doing completely. So call to action is go and make something and have some way of actually demonstrating your passion. So that's a really important thing that I, I hope you take away from this talk. It was something that Tony Robbins said, and he said that what would you do if you knew that you couldn't fail? So if you can quarantine in these little research projects, or these little pet projects, and make sure that failure is not going to have a huge detrimental effect, 
then you remove failure completely. So there is no failure. So then hopefully you're going to get the best out of people. Uh, there's a whole bunch of links. I know you guys can't see that, but uh, it'll be on the slides. So there's links to videos and, and books and that sort of thing that I found pretty useful. And um, follow my dog on Twitter, Bad Lassie. 270 followers. It's actually obscene. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? <coughs> no questions. Cool. Thanks very much, guys.